We are very privileged today to once again be able to welcome uh, Bosov, uh, who's part of the family, um, the LifeWork family. He has spoken at various uh, of our chapters, um, uh, so we, we are always blessed. And uh, this is probably going to be one of those highlight sessions for you uh, for the year, no pressure. Um, I have managed to insult him uh, all the previous years that I introduced him. So this year, I decided to not step into it, and uh, he was brilliant at retaliating and uh, hitting me just below the knees as well, and my ego crumbled. So uh, I decided to throw one of our coaches under the bus today, give uh, Ernie the privilege to just come and introduce Bosov to us and uh, maybe mention what last year's session meant to him. Thank you, Ruan. Uh, th this is just one thing that you have to grasp also about leadership and uh, life work also, is you will always be thrown under the bus or over the bus or be extended in your capacity uh, just to, uh, to share or to do something. So be ready. At any stage, you can be here standing here and introduce somebody to the group. Uh, but it's a privilege for me this morning to introduce Boss of Krobler. Um, if I think about this session, I think we also had a discussion on our, our table, and I think about calling. This is really an important session for every one of us to really understand what calling is. And uh, first and foremost, I think for us it's to understand that we were created by God for God. And you, will, you would have heard it also, heard it also in the Ask Guinea's uh, uh, book or in the session that he has also done with the with the video thing, but for me, it's always to bring it also to a place where you understand your humanness, your menslikate. I don't know if uh, humanness is the right word, but your menslikate. And um, last year's session, uh, Boss have presented also this, uh, uh, this calling session, and uh, there was something that was just amazing about this high-profile uh, person in the business world coming and sharing his humanness. So I was really grabbed with that last year, just to see that he also has a wife and kids, and there's a reality of him being hijacked and confronted with stuff in this world that was stuff and uh, uh, that isn't always easy to handle and isn't easy to, to go through, but really to understand that in that, in your humanness, even being a high-profile businessman or being in ministry or being whatever you are doing, you can also be confronted with worldly stuff, with stuff that challenges you. Uh, I was uh, just uh, before this uh, moment just introducing myself to Bosov. It's the first time that we introduce each other. Uh, we got the opportunity to be introduced to each other. But he just said something interesting in his, uh, uh, let's, my, let's call it his elevator speech, for his degree, and that's just something interesting for us to know, uh, for his degree, he paid his way through a pub, guys in a pub, and uh, uh, singing to them in a pub, and the money that he got from that was also money that he used to pay for his degree. That's strange for me, because one of the ways that I paid for my degree was to do clown work at street corners. And God uses the sane or the insane stuff uh, for us to come to that point where we really understand and know the call and the purpose. It's for us to go through certain things to come to that point where we live out the call and the purpose. Uh, maybe it's sometimes something small, but sometimes it's really just pressing in. For me, it's a privilege this morning to introduce Boss of Krobler to you. He's from the Ashburton Group. He's the CEO of the Ashburton Group. And you will really be inspired by this session and just by, uh, be inspired by the whole thing about calling this morning. So, Boss of you, welcome to stand here. I'm going to ask you to extend your hands towards him. He's going to bless us this morning. Let's just, before we going to be blessed by him, bless him and just pray for him in this moment. Lord, thank you for Bosov. Lord, thank you for who he is. Lord, thank you for the call on his life. Because of the call that you have on his life, Lord, he can bless us this morning just to inspire us and to just meditate for a moment on our call. Lord, thank you that we can be encouraged this morning, and that we can be lifted up by understanding that we were not just created to get money or to use money, but that we were created to be used by you and to glorify you 
and to honor you. Lord, we bless him this morning, and as he's going to share this morning, we pray that you would just encourage his spirit, and that he will also be filled with your joy and with your peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sure. Thanks for the kind words. Um, you have to be smart in life, right? So if you can't sing and you want to make money through singing, you have to sing to inebriated people. That's the only way to, to get past. So uh, that worked well. Um, it's such a privilege to, uh, again, share on this whole notion of, of calling and purpose. And I want to start today by probably making the biggest mistake that you can in public speaking. So they teach you when you do public speaking that you don't start off with a personal question. Okay, so it's a, it's a bad thing to start off because you get too close to people and uh, then they just shrug you off. But since you now know that I have, uh, have sort of a singing talent, uh, I thought maybe I can use it. So, you see, please don't shrug me off right now because it, it reminds me of this boy uh, he started smoking at the age of 14. It's not me. I started at 13. But at the age of, <laughs> age of 14, uh, he wanted to just get out of the house. And he was walking in the neighborhood, you know, tracking away in his cigarette. And there was an old auntie, Tani, that came across him, driving past him. And she got out of her car. She got out and she put her finger in his face and she said, Boy, you should not be smoking. It is bad for you. You are going to die and so on and so forth. And he looked up at her and he said... Um, my grandfather grew to be a hundred. And her response was, oh, did he smoke? And his response was, no, he just minded his own business. <laughs> so I don't want to mind my own business. I am going to ask you a personal question. So maybe just for a moment, think about this, uh, this question. On a scale from one to ten, where one is very little and ten is a lot, how would you rate your impact in this world? So you don't have to write it down because somebody next to you will see. But just rate the impact that you've had on your wife or your kids or your family, um, the ministry that you might be in, the business that you're in, the community that you're in, South Africa, wherever you've been in Russia. What is the impact that your life to date has had? Okay. You see, the, the, the issue with, with impact and is that it's very, very relative. So you don't, I mean, you can have a lot of impact at the age of 20, or you can have very little impact at the age of 40. So impact is very, it's a very, a very relative thing. And what I want to share to you, with you today is, in my opinion, the impactfulness of business leaders, the impactfulness of leaders in this country is 100% aligned with whether you have been able to figure out with God Almighty your calling in this world. It's 100% aligned, in my opinion. So I'll tell you a, a quick story of a, a very short life that's had a very big impact. So last year, uh, we, we had to greet a friend of mine that passed away from, um, of cancer, stage 4 cancer, the of, age of 52. So, he's a great friend of mine, he was my tennis partner, he was a great friend of my wife, and August last year, he, he phoned me and he, he said, I want to invite you to, uh, to have cake with us. I made cake, he doesn't bake, so he probably bought it, but we went, and uh, after about a year of chemo, they said they can't do chemo anymore, and he invited us to his house, and I was sitting across the, across the table from him, his wife ushered my, my wife out, and uh, he asked me a very simple question. About two months before he passed away, he said, would you do me the honor of um, presiding over the, my burial service? I'm like, Yo, but that's, uh, you can ask me anything else, but please don't ask me that. So this guy with a, a very good sense of humor, he said, but I am asking you now. And then he went, and I'm dying here, you know, you have to, you have to, uh, and I, I didn't laugh. And um, this guy then passed away two months later, a week before he passed away. Blade and I were at his, on his bed at the oncology center in Lizard Company of Mary. And he was, he was like, he couldn't breathe anymore. He was really in a, in a very tough spot. And 
I asked him, are you all right? And he just shook his head. I said to him, are you, are you scared? And he shook his head. I went like vigorously, I'm not scared. I know where I'm going. He knew the Lord. And, and then I said, are you concerned? And his answer was yes. And I said, Robbie, why are you concerned? And he made two statements that I will never forget. And these are two statements of the need and the urge and the wants out of all of us to make an impact in our world. I said to him, Robbie, why are you concerned? He said, the first thing why I'm concerned, and he was like trying to get the, this uh, out of his body. He said, I wanted to do more. I wanted to do more. I said to him, Robbie, you are crazy. The impact that you've had on my life, the impact that you've had on my wife's life, while you were like struggling for your life, you carried me through 2018 and stuff, my little world that I was busy with and I was trying to sort out. You prayed for me every week. You, you called me and you knew we had like issues with one of our kids and you called me and you carried my wife and you carried me while you were dying. You had a massive impact on my family. Don't tell me that you wanted to do more. And then the last thing he said was also an issue of impact. And he said, I would have been a great granddad. So this is a guy that was, I mean, it was the last time that he was going to have a, like a chat, sorry. So it was the last time that he was going to have a chat. And he's talking about impact. He's talking about making a difference in this world at the age of 52. So we had the, the funeral and... Yeah, that was a, a tough day, but that place was absolutely packed. So he was a claims adjuster at one of the, at the, the, the insurance companies. And I mean, there were like mechanics and builders and colleagues and tennis partners and golf bot. And that place was absolutely packed. And when, when we finished and Blade and I went for coffee afterwards, I was absolutely frazzled. And um, I just said to her, you know, this guy, this friend of ours, he was an impact player. The impact that he had just walking around and listening at the reception afterwards, listening to people, how he's impacted their lives in business, outside of business, in church, outside of church. This guy was an impact player. He understood something about his purpose and his calling in life. Now, his son-in-law, a few, few months after, phoned me and he said, um, can I have a chat with you? And I said, sure. You know, what do you want to chat about? He says, no, I want to chat about how my life can be as impactful as my father-in-law. So there's something about this man that now had an impact on the next generation. And this, this guy now asked, how can I be as impactful as my father-in-law? I said, sure, you know, please come and we can have a chat. He said, no, you need to be, just wait before you answer because I need a few answers. Because I need to understand why God took my father-in-law away. I need to understand why God took my, my father away when I was young. I want to understand why we can't have kids. I, don't, I want to understand all of these things before I can align with God in my purpose, in making an impact. And this young guy, he's not even 30 yet, made the most profound statement that I've ever heard around purpose and calling. And that is, before I can commit to purpose and calling, I need to see the world through God's eyes. I want to understand my world through God's eyes. And that commitment, that's the first step in this journey towards impact and to understand our calling through impact. Now you'll see in your, in your booklets, the first part of called to make an impact. It's described there as the preliminary calling. The preliminary calling. So the preliminary calling is literally saying, I am not going to listen to one more TED talk around purpose or calling. I am not going to Google one more time what calling means and what my purpose is. I am not going to read one more book. And I just want to ask Ruan, did you actually read that book, The Call? Like the whole thing, or are you just having a go at everybody else? <laughs> you see, no answer. Yeah, <laughs> he's had a few years to read it now. <laughs> so, this, this young man's quest 
to see the world through God's eyes before he can even start to commit to make a calling or an impact through a purpose that God has got in his life. That's the first step, a preliminary calling where essentially Jesus calls us and say, come and see what I see. Come and see about you what I see in you. Come and see the world through my eyes. Because if you agree, if you align to the way that I see things, then your impact through me in this world will be absolutely astounding. So if you want some scriptural reference there, Isaiah 55, 8 to 9, it says the following, For my thoughts are not your thoughts. You see, this thing about when we, when we pray and what we, what we ask God, okay, God, should I be doing this? Should I be doing that? There's this thing about this, uh, this cognitive bias that we hear what we want to hear. Christian people, when praying, you know, usually Christian people pray in two ways. So when they're worried, then they pray. And they pray in a way that's actually just uh, worrying out loud. It's not giving their worries to God. It's just like saying out loud, I'm worried about this, I'm worried about that. It's not prayer. Right? So that's just worrying out loud. And then telling God what they want. That's also just asking out loud. That's not submitting our will to God's thoughts. So this preliminary calling is submitting our will to God's thoughts. So for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. This is the, the preliminary call where we submit and say, Lord, I want to see this world through your eyes. I want to see myself through your eyes. And I think that the, probably the most important thing is for, if you are serious about making an impact in, in your child's life, in your wife's life, in your business life, in this country, in this world, is you have to be able to look at yourself and you have to be able to look at the world around you through God's eyes. Because if you do not do that, you bring your own issues and your own upbringing and your own self-righteousness and your own pain and your own issues, you bring to the table. And then your impact diminishes every time that you bring something to the table that is not of God. And maybe you'll sit in a bed sometime and uh, you have to figure out for yourself what impact have I had in this world. So the first thing that I had to learn, and I learned it over and over and over and again, is I need to trust what God sees in me. Because sometimes I've got an overinflated idea of myself, sometimes I've got a, like an underinflated idea of myself, but if I have an accurate estimation of who I am through God's eyes, then that's the first step to seeing this world myself through His eyes. We went on a, on a holiday this year. If you know me, for the past four years, I spent holidays in hospital. Somehow I get hurt or injured or whatever. So uh, my kids said that we shouldn't go on holiday anymore. So this holiday, I wasn't in hospital at all. But I went, I went on holiday with a whole raft of questions for God. I said, listen, I've got, I'm, I'm taking the longest holiday that I've ever taken. I'm taking four weeks. We are going to go away. I had this whole list of questions that I wanted to ask God. It was questions from, it was impact questions, right? So I had a question of my, my oldest son is now turning 21. So I wanted to understand what my impact is in his life, if any. Our daughter is now going to high school. I, and I asked her, so what is my impact? What is my role in my daughter's life? Our youngest son is now changing like a language medium in school from Afrikaans to English. I, and I asked God, so what must my impact be with him? Last year and the year that we went through, and anybody that runs a business and has been through 2018, I mean, our business went through a very, very tough time. And, and then the time that I spent in our business took reserves out of my marriage. And, and I asked God, Lord, what, can I, what must I do to put back reserves into my marriage after this year that I had? We've got an election that's coming up now, and there's a high likelihood that the ANC is not going to get a, a 50% um, majority. Now, the impact of that is a coalition government for the, which this democracy is not mature enough. So, Lord, what is my role? Is there an impact that I must play in that world? Lord, this economy is probably going to get worse before it gets worse if you look at what's happening with ESCOM. Lord, is there, is there anything that I need to do in my business? 
So there was all these questions. It's right questions, right? It's impact questions. And as I was journeying through this, and I, every time that I sat down, I said, Lord, I want to ask you, ask you these questions. And he said, okay, but I don't want to talk about these things. I said, Lord, I've got a four-week holiday. You've got a long time that you can speak to me about this. And every time that I sat down, I just experienced that the Lord said, I don't want to talk about this. And what the Lord took me to is he, I, he said, I want to talk about you. Because if you understand how I see you, you will understand very clearly what your impact on these things would be. But you first need to align yourself to my view. And he went meticulously again through all the gifts. And that's maybe the first point if you want to write it down. If you want to see yourself through God's eyes, spend some time with him in figuring out what the gifts are that he just birthed you with. The gift of things that is given you that you are better than anybody else. Some of those things you don't like. But those are the things that when, when God says, I formed you in your mother's womb, I've given you some gifts, I've given you things that you are brilliant at. Start with those gifts. Those are the things that, that's an indication of where you can align yourself towards impact. Then he went through some of, the, some of the things that I've learned, the things that I've studied, the things that I've experienced, the exposures that I've had. And he, and he meticulously went through those big themes in my life of what in the exposures that I've given you, the opportunities that I've given you, what have you learned and what skills have you honed, what experiences have you been able to, to hone because that's also part of your impact. And at this point where I was at this like emotional high, you just, Lord, I'm great. Hey, you gave me all of this. You gave me this exposure. Then he went to the place of, okay, all the places that you made big mistakes. What did you learn there? Because what you learn in mistakes are equally important in who you are and the impact that you are going to have in this world. You see this, this verse in, in 2 Timothy 1 verse 7, you might have heard this verse before about, um, you know, I didn't give you a spirit of peer, uh, fear, I've given you a spirit of, of power and of love and of sound mind. There's an amazing translation in, uh, in uh, the, the mirror translation that says the following about seeing yourself and the gifts that God has given you through his eyes. Become fully acquainted, Paul writes to Timothy, become fully acquainted. If you want to make an impact in this world, become fully acquainted with his gifts in you. There's nothing timid about it. There's nothing timid about it. The dynamic of a mind liberated in the spirit of love is fearless and unstoppable. The word that's, uh, that's used here for a mind liberated, let me just get the, I'm not Greek, so I can't. Sophronismos is the Greek word in the, in, the, in the original translation that's used here. And sophronismos means the following. It's a saved mind, a mind saved from tolerating inferior thoughts. It's a mind that says, listen, if you've got this whole idea of, of Christian humility and you think that I always need to be like the, the lowest and the lowliest, you are disregarding the gifts and the experiences and the things that God has done for you in order to help you through your mistakes. He has made you. He has gifted you. He wants to have an impact through you, but you need to be understanding of how he has made you. First step, seeing yourself through his eyes. And as part of this journey, as part of if you're in a place where you feel that, you know, maybe my impact is two, maybe my impact is three, maybe my impact is five. These are things that are just so massively important for you to be able to see in a preliminary calling yourself through God's eyes. And then to be able from that vantage point to see the world through God's eyes. So who has had thoughts looking through your eyes to South Africa to go to Australia? Who's had the thoughts? Yeah? Who's been to Australia? Okay. Who's had thoughts to go to Middle Earth, which is New Zealand? And that's where they shot the movie, Lord of the Rings, right? So who's, who's that thoughts of going to New Zealand? 
Any thoughts to go to the U.S.? Steve, you're not allowed to vote, yeah? Okay, so there's certain things, if we look at South Africa through the eyes of the star or the business day or the rapport or the build or heaven forbid the is genoot, then there's a particular outcome that you are going to align yourself to, right? Because that's the point where looking through the eyes of anybody other than God, you get scared. You get very scared. And when I, when I journey with, with, with fathers and with, with men, you know, they, they're not even scared for ourselves. Yeah? We're scared for our families. We're scared for our kids. So where, where are, you know, what's going to happen to my kids? That's, that's what I hear. And then when, when, when people talk about, about impact, the, the first question that I ask is, okay, so when you pray about South Africa, what does God say? What is God's view on South Africa? And a model that has really helped me just to understand this world, to understand the, the world through God's eyes, was something that I read a few years ago, um, the Pre-Sensing Institute from the Massachusetts um, Institute of Technology, the MI, MIT. They, they put a model together that showed me very, very clearly, and I can take it back to Scripture as well, but it was just a, a secular model about what the biggest challenges in the world are. Because if you understand the biggest challenges in the world, and you can align that with God, is this, are these the challenges that, are, that we are facing? And you see the world through God's eyes, and you see the challenges for what they are. Then you can take your gifts and your experiences and you can align them to these challenges and then you can freaking do something about it other than go to Middle Earth. So then you can do something if you know, if you see yourself through God's eyes how He's made you to make a difference, to have an impact, then you align that with the biggest challenges on earth today and guess what? The impact that He can have through your life doesn't matter where He's called you to. Great friends of mine have been called to go and work in different places. The best friend of mine, unfortunately, has been called to go to the U.S. of all places to go and work. God called him there. His family is there. But that was not as a result of what he saw through other people's eyes. That's what he saw through God's eyes. So just in... In a, in a world of what do you see in others? How, how, how does God see the world? There are three divides that we struggle with as humanity that I think describe very well what the challenges are that we face in South Africa, that we face in China, that we face in India. It doesn't matter where, where you can go to or where you work. You will find, for those of you that... I heard somebody say that they do work in Mauritius. Somebody said they do work in, in, in Germany. All of these things are appropriate and applicable as the biggest challenges that all of us face. The first challenge is the ecological divide. So it's this fact that we take more from earth than what she can regenerate every year. The ecological footprint on earth that man has on earth is 1.5 times. So that means every year we take 50% more from earth than what she can rejuvenate, regenerate. That's the reason why in the past 30 years, a third of the world's arable land, a third, ne? a derde, 33.333%, the third of the world ar world's arable land disappeared, Gone. That's the reason why in 15 years from now, what you pay for food will double. What that does to the share price of Woolworths, I don't know, because all of us will be shopping at ShopRite. This is not a stock tip, by the way. This is actually a joke. So, it's going to double. And I can promise you, my salary is not going to double in the next 15 years, because inflation is at 4 to 4.5%. Okay, so that's the ecological divide. We just take, 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 and nobody is saying, listen, I've got skills and I've got gifts and I'm going to align these skills and gifts and I'm going to do something about this ecological divide. So in our world, in our, in our little business, we said, in order to fight this ecological divide, we are going to raise money out of whoever wants to give money and we're going to allocate money towards 
a, a new way of generating uh, electricity, for example. So we've got uh, renewable energy funds that we attract money to, and we're gonna, we want to, in our little world, the little skill that we have around, around asset management and fund management and in finance and in, in, in those types of world, we are using the skills and the capacities that God has given us, and we are aligning it to do something about the biggest challenges in the world. Does that make sense? So I had a, the amazing opportunity. Who's written a, who's got kids? Let's just ask that first. So who, whose kids have to do like orators, speeches? Yeah? So who buys the speeches? No, don't put up your hand. So who's written speeches for the kids? It's an amazing blessing. It's an amazing opportunity to teach them something. So our kids now had uh, Nina's 14 and Miko is 11, they had to do speeches. And uh, they said, Daddy, you're traveling a lot. One Saturday, just before the rugby, they said, will you write our speeches quickly? And I said, yeah, sure. And I wrote it about this, about the ecological divide and the social divide and the spiritual divide and what they can do in their little world to do something about this. Now, our daughter, Nina, She's, uh, she loves ecology, she loves the world. If she watches movies and, and, and there's an animal that gets hurt, she starts crying, and I mean, she gets aggressive then, so then you need to know that you're in trouble. But I, I wrote the whole speech about Nina and her life and what she can do about the ecological divide. And in saying that speech, she's such an introvert, hey? so when she makes a speech, she talks like this. When she did this speech, she was so excitable. She was like, she, not foaming at the mouth, but she was excited. This little girl of 13 is trying to start to understand the way that God has made her, but aligning that to a challenge in the world and saying, but listen, I've got a hope, I've got a future, and I want to align, in her words, I want to align Africa's ecology to God's words and God's vision. 13. The power of if you get it, your kids will get it. If you're afraid... Your kids will be afraid. If you talk about the, the social divide, that's where the haves and the have-nots and the, and the discrepancy and the capture, uh, the, just the, the big divide between them, those just increase. A third of the world's population have to get by with 30 bucks a day, 30 rands, not dollars. You can buy a cappuccino for 30 bucks. And that divide just keeps on going and keeps on going. That's why we run the business that we run, because we said there are three reasons why we started this company that I'm involved with. First reason was we are going to close this social divide by helping those people that cannot save and haven't been saving to save. The amount of times that, that I spent at like universities and schools and places to talk about, listen, how do you save if you're not in, you know, how do you get financial literacy going and how do you get people to save and then creating products and then putting it on, on digital platforms so that people can invest? That's the first reason why we exist. We've aligned what we do, financial services, and we've aligned it to a big, 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 big divide in this world. And that is saying people are not saving and we're creating product to do something about it. The second reason why we exist is those people that are saving, that have pension funds and so on and so forth, to help them do so more effectively. The reality is that 74% of people that live in South Africa and that work in South Africa will not be able to retire in the same way that they live. 74%. Which means that 74% of us will be living with our kids. So if you don't have kids, you've got a problem. No, so you, we do something about that. There's a divide. So those people that uh, have pension funds, we do a lot of things and put a lot of products in the market to get pension funds to be more effective, to bring the costs down in pension funds, to give new products into pension funds so that they can invest in a better way. Third reason why we exist is there's a billion dollar deficit every year in funding infrastructure in Africa. A deficit, there's a decord. There isn't enough by a billion dollars. So we've raised funds on the continent of Africa to bring funding into Africa to change the way that Africa is funded and to try to close that gap. Our little world of finance, that gift that God has given us, that's the, the, the skill that God has given us, aligning it to the social divide. Our oldest son, Andreas, is signing to be a, a quantity surveyor. The thing that he has in his mind as an identity, he wants to get involved in city rejuvenation. 
He wants to use his time, he wants to use his skills, and he wants to make Pretoria, he wants to be part of the rejuvenation of Pretoria and of Johannesburg of those cities. This is a child of 21 that is thinking about he, how he can make an impact in this world because he understands what God has made him to be and he sees what gaps there are that he can close. The spiritual divide is something that we're talking about today, and that is the divide between the life that I'm living and the life that I know that I should be living. World Health Organization in the year 2000 did a study where they, they realized that double the amount of people that die in wars and terrorism and crime or in that year of 2000, double the amount of people that died in those ways committed suicide. And it's because of the spiritual divide. It's because people, when you ask them, what is the impact that you want to have? It's Ten. What is the impact that you're having? Three, four, five. And that, that discrepancy between the two is what takes people to the point of depression. That takes people to the point of substance abuse to now to medicate this reality that they, that they can't live with. The preliminary divide. Then, when you understand how God sees the world, how God sees you, that's when the primary call comes in. The primary call. I want to share this verse with you. And it's a verse that, that talks about God, in the first instance, through the preliminary call, calls you and say, come and see with me. Now, the, preliminary, uh, the primary call then says, Come and walk with me. Walk with me. Because I don't know what the right timing is. I don't know what the right thing to do is. I'm not, I'm not smart enough. I can figure out if I want money, I sing to drunk people. I can't figure out how to fix those, those divides. But God says, I'm not leaving you just with that insight about who you are and what the world needs. I want to walk with you in being effective and having an impact. Now, a verse that's meant a lot in my life is John 5, verse 20. So here, Jesus, uh, he raised this man next to the bath of Bethesda on the Sabbath, and now the Pharisees are going uh, having a go at him, and they're saying, yeah, but you know, you, you, you're not allowed to, to heal people on the Sabbath. And then he says the most abominable thing. He says, my father works on a Sunday or on a Sabbath. I will work as well. And now, heaven forbid, he says, he says that he is the son of God. And now the Pharisees want to kill him because he broke the Sabbath. And also now he is saying that he is God. He recounts and he says the following, John 5, 20, For the father dearly loves the son. So that talks about identity. That, that talks about the, the preliminary call. This is saying that I love you because I've made you and I've given you these capabilities and I've given you these gifts. I have made you in this way. Because why? Because I freaking love you to bits. I love you so much that I want to involve you in showing people how I love them. That's love. It's like my son wants to come and bry with me. He, he burns everything and so on, but I, I bring him into my world. I show him, okay, this is how you're doing it. That's wrong. Don't do that again. So I help him, but I bring him into my world. And together, we cook food and we provide for the family. So I love him. My, for the father dearly loves the son, and this is the key point of the, of the primary call. And he shows him everything that he himself is doing. The primary call. He shows me how to walk, what to do, when to do it. And then the impact point. And the Father will show him greater works than these. I say, I had my list of impact things. I have my list of things that I want to do. God took me back to, listen, I love you and I've made you in this way. And if you understand that this is from me, then you be, have to be in my rhythm. I have made so many mistakes going after God's call on my life, but in the wrong time. I have made so many mistakes in saying, God, you've given me the plan, I'm going to go, and I've just totally missed God's initiative and God's timing on my world. 
What Jesus is saying is here is, God, you have the initiative. If you say go, I will go. If you say no, I will leave it. If you say start something new, I will start it. But if you haven't said it, I will not move. People come and call Jesus and say, your friend Lazarus is dying. How long does he wait to go to Lazarus in John 5? Um, he waits three days until Lazarus is dead. Why? So that he goes to Lazarus, he raises him from the dead, and a whole region comes to know about the power of God. Timing. The guy next to the, the bath in Bethesda, how long was he ill for? 38 years. God could have raised him right, right there. The blind guy also in John, he was, he was blind from birth, not because of things the Bible says of what he's done or what his parents done, so that when God's timing comes, that the miracle can be done and the world can be changed. Why? Because we are in step with the Father. I've made so many mistakes in our business, in my life, in my marriage, in my career, where I said, Lord, you said this will happen. You didn't say when, but I'm going to force the issue now. Learn from Jesus. It says in John 5.20, I will only do what I see the Father doing. That is the primary call. Don't skip this step. Because then, when you get to the secondary call, this is where God said, see like I see. In the preliminary call. Then, in the primary call, He says, do as I do. When I do. When I say. Not what you think. Especially the guys. We just want to, if things go wrong, we're going to fix it. Maybe things are wrong for a reason because God wants to have a bigger impact in your life and you take the initiative away from Him. And then you come to the secondary call where God says, listen, I want you to work with me. Work with me. Now, unfortunately for all of us, what I found in my life is when you work with God, things are risky. Things have trials. Things have tribulations. When God calls you to attack one of the biggest divides in the world, the, the, the divide between the haves and the have-nots, guess what? The haves are going to come after you. When God calls you to, to close some of the biggest divides, the people will fight you. Why? Because the incumbents will come after you and say, but listen, this, this divide, the way that the world is working at the moment, benefits me greatly. And they will come after you, and they will come after your business. The enemy will come after your family. You must know that when you step into the secondary call, when God says, work with me, it is going to be hard. And in many circumstances, it will be dangerous. Because the biggest fights are the ones that will get the biggest victory. If you want to have an impact of 10 in this world, you can only do it through God, doing what He has made you to do, Focus on those things that are the worst things that have to be fixed in this world. And then, working with Him tirelessly doesn't matter what happens. Now, in making that statement, that's a big statement. Because since the time that I've started to understand God's call on my life, the enemy has come after me and my family. The enemy came. There's no reason why at the age of 35 you get cataracts, right? No reason. There's no reason why you, on a holiday, the first holiday of many where I spent in a hospital, that I fall from a flight and stairs and, and tear my back muscles. There's no reason that horses that I love breeding and I love riding I come off a horse and I, and I break a lot of things in my body, including my C1 vertebra. And I'm this close from being paralyzed. There's no reason why after two years of recuperating from that, on a holiday again, uh, we, my wife and I are taking hanky hanky there, walking into the ocean and my 100 kilogram nephew comes behind, he tackles me and he tears everything in this left knee that I've got. He says he wasn't running fast. 
But you, you know, at 100 kilos, I don't know. His father says that the, the only difference between his full speed and his, his jog is like the expression on his face. You don't know what the, what the difference is. There's no reason. There's no reason. Enemy coming after my, after my health. Enemy coming after my, my safety and the hijacking that was referred to earlier. The enemy coming after my, my wife and her health. Being diagnosed with a, with a degenerative back disorder that, um, that's really giving her a hard time. The enemy coming after our kids when in the things that we do together, we love riding horses together and I mean horses just from nowhere going ballistic and running off and putting them in danger. The enemy coming after our business and, and putting political strife and issues into our business and trying to, to take away from what God has called this business to do. The enemy coming. I mean, the craziest thing now, after all of this, God, I'm doing what you, you said I must do. I'm within your time frame. Can I now just rest? My wife turns 50. We go on holiday. I, we save money and we go. I take her to Rome. Yeah, it's like very romantic. Go to Rome. Get to Rome. Uh, got the wrong passport. So it's my mistake. I thought maybe by metrics, if they're nice, they would let me through. So I spent time in a, like a jail in Rome. Like Paul, very spiritual. It's my wife's 50th birthday, and I spent it in jail in Rome. Enemy calf coming after our rest. In the secondary call, we need to understand this. Peter writes and he says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal which is taking place to test you. Who's ever shared a cell with people from Syria that's trying to get out of the country? Okay, that's a fiery ordeal. I've never been put in the back of a, of a police van and then like extradited from a country. Yo, I have like an ego, right? They took my passport, gave it to the pilot and said, this guy is a criminal, please take him out of the country. A fiery ordeal, stupidity I know, but still a fiery ordeal, which is taking place to test you, that is to test the quality of your faith as though something strange or unusual were happening to you. It is par for the course. It is par for the course. It is really, it is, it is my prayer that in this journey, this this blessing, this opportunity that you've got and this time that you've brought out, I don't know how you got here, but you're here for a reason. And part of that reason is if you've, got, if you've got an unctioning in your heart that the question that you answered right at the beginning, what your impact is, and this question, what do you want your impact to be in this world? with your family, with your kids, with your work in this country, if there is a, if there's a dissonance between those two digits, the moment of understanding your preliminary call, seeing the way that God sees, your primary call, walking with God, your secondary call, working with God, you've got such an opportunity to impact this world as a called one of the Almighty. It is my prayer that you will use this opportunity, that you won't pass it by. Because if you get it, your kids will get it. If you get it, the people that work with you will get it. If you get it, this country and this continent and this world will be a better place. Can I pray for us very quickly? Is that right? Lord, I want to I thank you for this opportunity of people just having the opportunity to stand back and see what impact you want to have through their lives. There are people here, Lord, that you want to raise up as impact players. There's people here that you want to raise up as the people that would just make this world a different place because they've caught something of your heart for this world. I pray that this Holy Spirit will be only the start of a journey for them. Amen. Amen.